Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and we meet here at the church also on those days. So if you're ever in the neighborhood, like to come on by. Like our sister Diana, she came by today, and she's here. So we're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are continuing on in the book of 2 Corinthians, and we'll be in chapter 10. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Father, we come before you now, and we pray that you just begin our beautiful day, Lord God. Uh, though we wish the sun was out, but, but yet, Lord, I thank you for the overcast in the morning and keeping it sort of cool, Lord, so that um, we can enjoy the morning, uh, just crisp air, Father. Also, that the fact that it just keeps uh, things green, Lord, without being scorched by the sun and the drying of the soil. Father, it's just, I, I love that morning dew, Father, and then get into a nice warm day. And I thank you for today, Lord. Guide us and lead us, number our steps, Father, and minister to us through your word, Lord. I, I pray, Lord, that I can somehow remove myself at this moment, Lord, and allow your spirit, Lord, just to be our teacher. Uh, let it be through, through him that we understand and learn from your word, Lord. And may we grow in faith and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, again, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. We are in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. So this is our third time going through the, the New Testament. And we're, we're doing pretty good for the third time. We're, we're in Corinthians and have a few more books and we'll be in Revelation pretty soon. So be our third time of going through so kind of exciting um and every time i do go through it you know i just allow the holy spirit to to lead me as i'm reading and and just lead me to touch on some things as a devotion so let's just believe that as as we're reading the word and as it's being expound on it's the holy spirit that's that's teaching us i don't want to be the teacher i want him to be that teacher so so let's continue on in, in chapter 10 now you remember eight and nine we're dealing with finances right with with funds and support of the church which is important and now he goes on to chapter 10 he says now i paul myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of christ who in present am lonely, lowly among you, uh, but being absent am bold towards you. I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intended to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. What is walking according to the flesh means? It's obviously contrary to walking in the spirit. So there are two phrases that we use as Christians often times. You know, are you in the flesh or are you in the spirit? Or we'll go up to someone and say, you're in the flesh, you know, because you're not in the spirit. So what does that mean, being in the flesh and being in the spirit? When you're in the flesh, you're dealing with issues and struggles and trials of life in your own strength. That's being in the flesh. You're using your own resources, your own understanding to figure these things out. That's being in the flesh. Being in the spirit is opposite of that. You're depending totally on God. You're going to God, to his word, to find the answers. You're praying and asking God to help you with the answers. Uh, you're finding strength in God's uh, um, work and peace from what he has done and not necessarily from your own. So there are two different views there on flesh and spirit there. We should, as believers, constantly be trying to walk in the spirit. Now, that's a struggle because we're people that are fleshly. We have a flesh part of us. The old man is still with us, and he always wants to be in charge and leading. That was the problem. Again, we saw that in Genesis where 
Eve was told by the serpent that you could be God if you partake of this fruit, and that's what God was worried about, that you would be God like him. Well, that, <coughs> that is our problem, is that we think we're gods and we can make up our own rules and live in our own strength, and we can't. We have to be totally you know, in the hands of God. You, you look at Jesus, and the best way to walk in the Spirit is look at Jesus. When you're dealing with a situation, go right to Jesus. What would Jesus do, right? We wear the bands, we see the bumper stickers, you know, we wear the shirts, I'm not of this world, and yet, <laughs> yet we make these decisions in the flesh. We really need to ask, what would Jesus do at this very moment? He'd probably humble himself. You know, he would probably humble himself. Jesus was never an arguer. I don't know if you ever noticed that when you're reading the gospel. He never argues with people. He just shares the truth and then he leaves it up to you whether you want to decide. There were points where he made statements of facts, and like the religious leaders coming uh, at him. Those were probably the more, uh, more excitable times of Christ's his ministry was whenever he dealt with the religious leaders. There's one point where where he said, you guys are, are, are whitewashed sepulchers. Now, he wasn't angry. He wasn't arguing with them. He was just stating a fact. Here you are, religious, and you walk in the flesh. You don't know the things of the Spirit. And so you're, you're like whitewashed sep sepulchers. A sepulcher was a grave, and it would be made of limestone. It was white on the inside, empty. And he was saying to them, your hearts are empty. You're like graves. You're dead men. You know, but he's not angry with them. He's just stating a fact. And he left it there. You know, if they wanted to argue back, he, he wouldn't argue back. In fact, oftentimes when, when they would ask him questions, he wouldn't even answer them, right? He'd ask a question back. You know, what about Caesar? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Tell us. You know, of course, they, they wanted to trap him. And, and he said, well, let me ask you something. You know, who has a coin? Show it to me. Whose image is on it? Well, Caesar's. Then give to Caesar what's Caesar's. You know, and give to God what is God. And I love that phrase because what Jesus was saying to them is you're made in the image of God and you should be giving and surrendering your life to God. And so making a, a, a matter of fact statement, you know, but not arguing. So walking in the spirit is telling the truth in love and in, in, in gentleness as best you can, you know, and then leaving the rest up to God uh, to do that work in someone's life. So he goes on. And he says here uh, that he did not want to come to them in the flesh, I mean, in, you know, in, in a bold way, but in a gentle, loving, caring way. Then he goes on in, in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So we all walk according to the flesh, as I said earlier, right? We live in these bodies, these tents, and these tents have the flesh. And we're walking in them daily, but we are not to, we are not to war with them. How do we do war? He tells us in Ephesians, we're to be praying, right, in the spirit. And we fight against powers and principalities of the air and not against flesh. So anytime we're battling against mankind, we're not battling correct. We need to be on our knees and then share that truth in love. For the weapon of our warfare are not carnal. Now, carnal is another way of saying fleshly, right? Uh, you can become carnal, in your reaction to people and in your battles. So we're not in a warfare of carnality, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience uh, when your obedience is fulfilled. So we... We're not carnal, but we're mighty in God. And, and that's the key, mighty in God. Again, what would Jesus do? And when we follow Jesus' example, it, it is powerful to live like Christ. Uh, our testimony is powerful. It will change, not just you, but it will change those that are listening to the testimony uh, that God has given to you. Uh, being in humility and walking in humility, in gentleness and meekness. And Paul defines meekness for us there in verse 1 where he says, by the meekness and gentleness, because meekness basically means gentle, power under control. And when we have power under control, we're meek. We understand that God's word is true and we should live by it. And when we give it to someone to explain, to instruct, whatever, to rebuke, let God do that work, and it's powerful. To, it's a powerful work that can be done um, through the Spirit of God. 
Then he goes on in verse seven, uh, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? But if anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so, we are Christ too. Now, because Paul's having problems with some men in the Corinthian church, you know, he's not necessarily defending himself, but, but he is giving truth to the fact that as we are all in Christ Jesus, as you are in Christ, so are we. We're in Christ also. You will have men or even women come into the church and they will try to discredit the leadership. They will discredit them in all kinds of ways. You know, one, they have no authority. Two, they have no education. Three, they don't know how to lead. You know, so they're always uh, discrediting you. Um, and so Paul is saying, look, you are in Christ and Christ is in you. He's also in us. And we need to remember that about one another. We're all children of God. And we should be very careful how we treat one another as children of God. Uh, Paul here is saying, these men are just bringing division. There's a, 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 fr a friend of mine in India. He just wrote me this morning and he said that there's a, a dear, he said that he calls, he, they always preface things with dear sister or sir and things like that. There's dear sisters in the church, but she's going around and she's causing little uh, dissensions, you know, and she, he says, pray for us. And, 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 and apparently she goes to other churches too. And so I said to him, I says, oh, I'll definitely pray for you, but you need to get her out of the church because if she's bringing dissensions and division, then it's only gonna get worse. What you need to do is ask her to leave and not to come back unless she's willing to repent and turn from that. You don't need that in the church and you need to deal with it as quickly as possible. Otherwise it will linger on and it will grow like cancer. And then you have to do major surgery. And you know in cancer, there's other tissue that gets thrown out too when they go in and remove it. And we don't want that in the body of Christ. So he goes on, verse eight, for even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. At least I seem uh, to terrify you by my letter. Now, Paul understood that God gave him authority as an apostle, but yet his authority was one to encourage and to strengthen, not necessarily to destroy and destruct. Uh, apparently there are some pastors, and I'm sure, that are out there that use their authority to destroy people. Um, I'm very cautious about my authority. I just learned this from Pastor Chuck and, and many others too, that I try to let God do the work in someone's life more than me trying to do the work in their lives. If they're struggling, you know, I'm there to come alongside them and help them, pray for them, encourage them, give them the word, you know, but ultimately they've got to go through it with the Lord. This is where they're going to uh, learn and deepen their understanding of who God is and their relationship with him. Um, I also will leave people to the Lord when they're, when they are causing divisions, you know, and they're struggling and yet, uh, um, Yet you don't want to destroy them completely by asking them to leave immediately, but you, you kind of pray and ask the Lord to give you wisdom. You talk to them and you encourage them to repent and to stop and, and so forth. There was a time where I did that here. You know, there was gossip going around, so I just kind of got everybody together. It needs to stop. It's not Christian-like. It's not what we should be doing. We should be encouraging each other, strengthening each other, and not gossiping. Um, and that's out of love. And it was corrected, you know. And the people that didn't like it, the Lord removed them. I didn't even have to ask them to, to, to leave. It was the Lord that just put, laid it on their hearts. And, you know, I'm just, I just feel like it's time to move on. Thank you so much. God bless you. We'll see you. We'll see you in heaven kind of, you know, thing. I mean, I miss them dearly. I miss them dearly. I think I can say this. I had a, we, Virginia and I have a dear friend actually dear family we we have they they were with us almost from the beginning just shortly after and we poured a lot into them uh, we created deep intimate relationships with them uh, we spent a lot of time with them and there was a point probably about 15 years of ministering with them that um, that there was some division that happened and they decided to choose the other side and they ended up leaving, leaving the church. And they're still dear, dear to our hearts. But some have suggested, well, you should go after them. Well, I don't know. 
should I or, or shouldn't I? That was my dilemma, and I had to pray about it. Sometimes you just need to let people go and let God do what he's doing, you know? And they went to another Calvary, and they were there, and they're still there, I, I suppose. But we just recently found out that uh, that dear sister had cancer, and she passed away on Friday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was broken inside. I mean, I was moved, uh, happy and rejoicing, because I know she's in the presence of God now. But just the history that I had with her, you know? in her family and not being able to be there, you know, in those last moments like I have with so many others that have been stuck in the church. And those are, those are the devastating uh, situations in a pastor's life, you know, that, that has poured into so many people and they've left for whatever reasons. And then you don't get to be a part of their, you know, lives anymore. And you just go, Lord, I know it's not about me. I know it's about your son Jesus, and you had a purpose and reason for it. But it still, it still hurts. It still hurts as a pastor because you love the people. You know, you love them. They might not think you love them, you know, but you love them. You know, because you've poured so much. You don't do this and not love them. You know, even when they're leaving, you're you're loving them in a sense. So Paul goes on, and he says in verse twelve or verse 11, let each uh, let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letter, by letters, when we are absent, such we also will be indeed when we are present. So in other words, I tell the truth. You know, I don't change. I'm going to share with you what is biblical, what is true, and what's on my heart. I'm not going to change with leather or whether it's in, in presence. For we dare not uh, class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. And, and so apparently these guys that are accusing Paul of things are, are ones that lift themselves up. They're, they're arrogant and they're prideful. And they compare themselves to other ministers and so forth. Um, and Paul said, I don't compare myself to anybody. I'm just going to be truthful with the truth uh, with you because I love you. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Now, when you think about that for a second, let's just think about that for a second. Why why is he saying they're not wise? Because they're comparing themselves to who? Other people. Other people, other men who are just as sinful as they are, who can be in the flesh, can be off, you know? So if we're going to compare ourselves, who do we compare ourselves to? Jesus, right? Let's compare ourselves to Jesus. That's a great comparison, and that's actually a, a good measuring rod for us and a good point uh, to um, uh, strive to obtain. You know, let's be like Christ. Let's walk in the Spirit. Because a brother can walk in the Spirit, and you see him walk in the Spirit. Yeah, I want to be like that. And we can encourage each other in the good things. But when it comes to the flesh, no, we need to be careful uh, that we're, we're not um, following after someone because it's unwise. We need to be more biblical right people than Christian, having that Christian worldview. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appoints us, a sphere which is especially includes you. For we are not extending ourselves beyond your sphere, uh, thus not reaching you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in your sphere, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. Apparently, that's what these guys were doing. They were boasting in the sphere of Paul. They were taking some of the credit of Paul, what was going on, you know, there. You know, when, when, let me give you a little hint. <laughs> when someone begins to say, my ministry has grown to this point because of what I'm doing, be careful, because that person's in the flesh. Oh, our ministry is only growing because the Lord is gracious to us. I love what our brother said on, on our luncheon on Saturday. Um, he shared a little bit of his testimony. And in his testimony, he said, now I give God the glory for things. You know, like people will say, oh, you finally got a job. No, the Lord finally found me a job. You know, and I love that because that's the proper perspective to have. It's the Lord doing the work in us and not not us doing the work. That's fleshly. When you think that you're building the kingdom, 
It's fleshly. I remember, um, and this was pretty profound, uh, when Dave Rosales shared a, a little story uh, to the guys uh, when his church was growing, and uh, someone from Biola wanted to interview him, ask him some questions. So he went to the to this meeting to meet him and so forth, and and the the guy asked him a question. <clears throat> uh, how did you do it? You know, basically, uh, how did your ministry grow? And then he had to step out for a second. He gave Dave a little time, and and the Lord spoke to Dave and said, "If you tell him that you did this, 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 I will take away my spirit from you." And David like, whoa. So when he came back, he said, "I don't know. It was just God. <laughs> it was just God who did it." You know, and that's the right answer, because it is just God. You know, I, this ministry has been built on the foundation of Christ and not Reuben. Now, yes, it was a family ministry. It is no longer a family ministry. It is a Christian family ministry now where God's children are involved. But, but everything that has been done here has been done through the Spirit of God. God has led people. God gave us the opportunity to purchase this building, this property. And then we... we we're able to stay here long enough that we built up all this equity, which has nothing to do with me. I have no control over the economy <laughs> and real estate, that we were able to pull money out and still have a very, very low mortgage and then remodel the church to the point where we, you know, have a beautiful place now. That's all God. That's that's not me at all. You know, that's God. The ministry of food, that has always been on Virginia and I's heart from the day that we got saved. We used to be in charge of what we called at the time, bless and be blessed. And it was a food ministry. And I had this little closet that I would put all the food into, built some cabinets, had, had uh, cans rolling down so that you pull the front, next one comes so that it, it, the expired dates are in order, you know? And we would give people, yeah, it, it was painted, it was clean, it was, yeah. Air conditioning, the whole bit. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, and it was blessed. And that's always been our heart to, to help the, the less fortunate, you know. And we did that he, here for years and years. And the Lord raises up someone to come in that has a passion and a heart for that. And then he begins to use them. And now it's turned into what, what we have today where we're feeding, you know, 100 families every Sunday you know, and we don't even have the resources to do that. That's God doing it, you know, and bringing in the resources. So it, it has to be God. And Paul's saying, these guys are boasting about what they're doing. And Paul says, I'm not going to. Beyond, it's beyond me. It's Christ doing it through me. So 15 says again, not boasting of things beyond measure. That is, it, that is in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in the sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord, for not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends, right? And that's exactly what I was saying. If we're gonna glory, if we're gonna boast about anything, let us boast in the Lord. That is proper. Some people don't get that. You can read that and share that with people, and then you can preach a message, and they'll come up to you and say, that was a good message, Pastor. And I usually will say, thank God. He is gracious. And they said, well, you had something to do with it. I'm like, you didn't get it. I had nothing to do with it. It's all God. And we, I'm not going to take any of the glory away from him at all. It's him. Yeah, but you had to sit down and actually read <laughs> I'm like, you really want me to take some glory? No, I'm not going to. Thank God. I mean, there's a point where you hear that over and over, different faces, just people that don't get it yet, you know, and you hear it, and finally you just say, thank you, God bless you, and you walk away because you just don't want to go through that whole ordeal again. But yeah, we have to understand that, that if it was not for God, guys, we wouldn't even be here, Amen. right? The breath we have comes from God. The heart that pumps in our chest is from God. You know that your heart is a muscle, and it's an involuntary muscle. You have no control over it at all. It, it pumps blood, and it pulses because God makes it pump blood and pulse. He's the one maintaining it. Think about it. Try stopping your heart. You can't. Only God can. 
The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, blessed be the name of the Lord. So God is in control of our very beings. So if we do anything good, it's because of God. And so we should give him glory and not rob him of his glory at all. Amen? Amen. So today, when you go out there and you do something good, praise God for it, that he's allowed you to do something good. It's okay. You know, some people will, will look at that and they'll go, but then I don't feel like I did it. Oh my. See, that's the narcissistic uh, attitude that we have. It's not about us. It's about surrendering to Jesus. We need to get rid of self. We need to get rid of self. It's not about us. We are instruments. As I shared before, a doctor does not praise the scalpel. The scalpel, the scalpel, <laughs> right? He doesn't praise the scalpel. Neither does the patient. Neither do the family members. They praise the doctor, the one who actually did the operation. We're just scalpels in the hands of a mighty God and being used for his glory. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your your precious word, Lord. And Father, the truth that we find in it that will bring peace and rest to our life, Lord, that we don't have to strive, Lord, that anything good that comes from us is from God, Lord. Lord, we don't even have to measure up. We just have to trust and put our faith in Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't study, we shouldn't read, we shouldn't improve ourselves, Lord. What I'm saying is let us give the glory to God as he opens and expands our minds and understandings to the truth, Lord. Be with my brothers and sisters. Bless them. Encourage them today, Lord. Bring grace and forgiveness to their lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you will, post this on your wall and share it with someone. You never know. They might come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you have any prayer requests, please uh, post them or private message me, and we are going to take some time right now and pray for you and for us here. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.